How are you all feeling? Fine? You need some coffee? Well, I'll talk about coffee later on, but uh, I'm not here to talk about the paper industry because you're really the experts. I'm here to really take up this title, which I think is very well chosen, Sense the Future. It's sensing, it's tasting, it's uh, getting a feeling of where are things going. And what I think is very important, the kind of work that I do, is that we're succeeding on moving forward. Can we move it forward? Because it's at this moment not moving forward. There we are. And let me do it. Thank you. Let's go one back. And now one forward. Yes, there we are. Perfect. Thank you so much. You know, you need a little bit of distress moment and de-stressing moments. I mean, it's the way things get in on track. When I'm here and standing in front of you, I just want to make certain that whatever I'm saying, whatever we are presenting, is not the product of one individual. It's an inspiration of years and decades of people who I had the privilege, the privilege of working with. And so, first of all, a sense of humility that we are all a product of our peers. And I just want to pay tribute to those peers by showing their picture. And maybe there's some of the people you recognize and maybe of them you don't recognize. Anyway, this is not a quiz. We're going on. But what I think is important is uh, I'm leaving here tonight because tomorrow I'm presenting in Italy my new book called The Third Dimension. And I'm looking at the trends that are actually underpinning, not the statistics, but the trends that are underpinning the movers and the shakers on the market. And I think that's important. We need to know who are the antennas, where are things changing beyond what we think is possible. I wrote this book in 2009, The Blue Economy. It's published in 43 languages. It's a book that has allowed me to crystallize the work that we have been doing around the world. Yes, I'm an entrepreneur. We've done more than 200 projects around the world, invested 5 billion euro and generated 3 million jobs. We've got a track record. And so I'm going to speak from the guts of this track record and the signs that we've been able to do, but asking you a very particular question. What do you get inspired by when you see a tree like that? Well, let me tell you what I'm inspired by. In a forest, there is no unemployment and no waste. Everyone has a job in a forest. No one is unemployed. Even the smallest saplings are contributing and there is no crash, no kindergarten for them. What I think is very important when we look at who you are and what you represent, there's some amazing symbolisms behind it. I have the privilege of working since 1994 with about 3,000 scientists. We're science driven. At the same time, I've been able to assemble about a thousand entrepreneurs. What we want to do is create a bridge between the science and the entrepreneur. What's the use of science that stays in the labs, that are translating to beautiful reports? What we're needing is people who change the rules of the game. And that's what we're all about, transformation. And we need to go with value added. And I think one of the great advantages is that you as an industry, you know that there's no value in just being a commodity. It's generating value added, but I'll add a few words to it, with what you have. You're not going to create value with things that you don't have. You're going to focus, and that requires innovation. Actually, the first promise of the commissioner was funding for innovation, not just funding. He wants to get innovation going. But what kind of an innovation do we want? I only focus on disruptive ones. We only undertake innovations that have never been done before, and therefore maybe some of them will be surprising. But. We have a very clear focus. Be positive. When we're in Patagonia and you look at this incredible forest, what's the greatest biodiversity you can see in this forest? The greatest biodiversity is the yeast. We're well, looking at more than 3,000 varieties of yeast in that forest. So which business are you in? Are you in the business of wood, in water, or are you in the yeast business? Let me tell you, 
Heineken thinks it's yeast, huh? And now we have the largest laboratories collecting the incredible yeast varieties through what is called a yeast safari. Have you been on a yeast safari in the forest? I mean, you get a forest. You could organize safaris if you wanted to. But what is yeast all important about? Without yeast, you don't have bread. You don't have beer. You don't have wine. Have you ever considered yourself as being the custodians of the yeast reserves of the world? I don't think so. You want to know the cash that is generated by yeast? You want to know what kind of a billion dollar business that is? You're sitting on it, you're not even looking at it, because when you look at it, it's too small to notice. And this is where we are. We want to have you positive mindset, even though the news is bad in the morning, we want you to have the positive mindset and keep on focusing on what could be done. Like this one here. Every boat can run on seawater and on solar. Now, when you know that this is the standard for the cruise ships, and I don't have to explain to you about the CO2 emissions and all of that, but when you know this is a standard, then please notice this is the alternative we've created. It's the first boat that goes around the world, and it's a boat that is solely working on solar, and with the solar energy, we're taking the salt water, inject the electricity from the solar panels, produce hydrogen, and we've been around the world already. We're going for a second time. We're trying to show the world that you only need salt water and solar panels and know how to make hydrogen because what's the byproduct when you're using hydrogen to power your engine? Water. Now, if you have power in water and you get salt water in the sun, what more do you need? Now, that's the kind of innovations we're going. We're going around the world for the second time now. We're, we're now going through the Panama Canal. This is not a Photoshop. This is a boat that exists. And what I think is important, it's disruptive, because you know in the Paris Agreement, the maritime industry got an exception. They're not in the Paris Agreement. I mean, talking about lobbying, we've got to congratulate them. I mean, this is lobbying at its best. You were able to extract yourself completely. But that's the kind of thinking we need. So let me talk about my first big example, because this boat is not our biggest example. That's a teaser. You've been talking about regenerating forests, and Europe is increasing its forest reserves compared to others. But what about regenerating the forest of the sea? Have you ever thought about that? Because, let's be honest, there's 70% seawater, 30% land. Should we only focus on the land? Shouldn't we be focusing a little bit on the other things that are growing? And, you know, in the sea, they have one great advantage. They don't have to go against the law of gravity. That means all that lignin is uh, much reduced. You know, talking about your pulping process, if you don't have lignin, it's make, well, make it a bit easier, right? I mean, all your crafting processes will be looking different. Science magazine in 2012 dedicated a full issue to the opportunities of regenerating the forest of the sea. We have projects around the world. We're pioneering this. But only three weeks ago, when there was the famous meeting COP23 in Bonn, somehow the American Department of Energy released a report saying that the future of energy in America is going to be seaweed. Totally unnoticed in the media, Google it, you'll find it. And America believes that by 2020, 10% of its energy requirements will come from seaweed. That went unnoticed in all these tweets and analyses. And why is President Trump underscribing this, subscribing this? For a very simple reason. He's sick and tired of the subsidies to Cargill and to ADM. Billions of dollars floating in converting <coughs> corn into ethanol. Is that the way to go in the future? And we know it is financially nonsense, but it has been the practice. So here you look at our platforms of how we regenerate farms in the sea forests in the sea. Now the beauty is that if you have a diverse rainforest, you can go to generate 250 tons of biomass a year per hectare. We're doing a thousand in the sea. Are we looking at competitive analysis? Are we looking at our strengths and weaknesses? Are we having a reflection of where can the biomass come from? Ladies and gentlemen, the sea is going to compete with the land because it's more competitive. 
And, and, and let's, let's then ask ourselves, what is it going to be used for? Well, just like you are looking at multiple new technologies to generate higher value, the same is happening with the seaweed industry. But the biggest market is going to tackle is going to be the shale gas market. You know shale gas? The fracking of the underground with chemicals to release. I mean, it's not the most environmental one, but it is the driver of the American economy at the moment. Look at the costing. Seaweed is 10 times cheaper. I put that big word on the screen before and said positive. If you are mad and uncomfortable and feel like joining Greenpeace because you don't want the soils to be fracked with chemicals, then I'm saying think again. Work out a much more competitive model. The change in the world will not come because we protest and we're against. The change in the world will happen when we have competitive models that will out-compete. And that is the new force that I'm discovering. Seaweeds are going to be part of the food chain, the fuel chain, and the textiles chain. Guess what? In China, two million tons of seaweed are already converted into towels. Did you notice? I mean, I know that you have Lyocell, I know that you have other technologies in order to make fibers, but keep in mind, the market shifts a lot, and many of the traditional analysts, they don't see what's happening in completely different sectors that are not even on the radar. Let me share with you our biggest regeneration of forest project we've done. We're in Colombia. And this forest is being regenerated in order to produce fuel. You say, fuel? What are you meaning? Yeah, we produce fuel. How do we do that? Well, first of all, let me say where we are. We're right there in the Vichada, next to the Orinoco River. We started 30 years ago, and we've now regenerated 8,000 hectares of tropical rainforest in an area that looked like this. The Spaniards destroyed it 250 years ago because they wanted to try cattle farming. This is an area where we, I'm so, sorry for if you're Spaniard, huh? I mean, this is absolutely, absolutely, uh, I, I should have said the colonizers, uh, and then you would have known who it was. This was the largest project in the world in 1984 with mycorrhizal fungus. We started planting, we planted 11,000 hectares with mycorrhizal fungus. 84. That's early. We have a 92% survival rate and we've able to change the pH of the soil from, from 4 to 6.8. Never put on any chemical. Never. It is a natural process that we engendered, but we understand that in order to regenerate this forest with that kind of a density, you need to have a way of welcoming biodiversity. A monoculture cannot do that. But we started with a monoculture. Because the monoculture of the pine tree, the Pinus caribe, was the only one that could withstand the heat and the harshness of nine months of drought. With a mycorrhizal fungus, of course, helping them to survive. That is now the most biodiverse rainforest that's ever been regenerated. We have 256 different plant species. That equals the Amazon forest plant species diversity. Human beings can regenerate, but, you know, regenerating for what? Well, we're tapping the trees and we're getting out the colophon. But in order to produce the colophon, some of you are chemists, you know that you need some vapor and your byproduct is turpentine. All the cars in our region operate on turpentine. Purified turpentine, which we actually blend with vegetable oils. And so we have a biodiesel that never needed methanol in order to generate the trans -eristification. We're the only project in the world that has fuels from trees without trans -eristification. We blend turpentine with oil. And we're having only 25,000 cars running it today, but it is nevertheless the largest project ever. And we think it is inspiring. This is our fuel production center. Everything is done locally. We don't do anything externally. Now, I just want to say, when you plant a forest, the first thing, of course, you get some products out of it. But the second thing you get 
is these byproducts, and the third one is this water. 70% of the local population when we started suffer from gastrointestinal diseases. Today, none. And every child that reaches the age of six in our community gets a bicycle to ride. Now, what do you think happens when kids have a bicycle to ride and drink water three liters a day for free? Well, they're so healthy that we close the hospital for lack of patients. You want to get sustainable development going? That's the kind of way we go. Now, most of the time we think the hospital is a need. No, the hospital means that you still have too many unhealthy people. We eradicated diabetes in the zone, and we got the statistics to prove it. We got the United Nations flying in to say, what happened here? Well, what happened is we regenerated the forest, we have biodiversity, we have drinking water, and guess what? We have full employment. When people are happy and healthy, they play music instruments, not guns. Part of my work is to translate all of that into children's stories, because what I present to you, to many people, will sound like fantasy. What I'm actually doing is I'm transcribing reality into fantasy, because our real base is reality. It's being done, just like with our cup of coffee. You know, every cup of coffee turns into clothing for us. Drink it and wear it. Who knows the program? You drink a cup of coffee, and with the waste of your coffee drash, Le Marc Café, with that waste, we put it into polyethylene. But let's not forget, coffee has a very unique lignocellulose. It is semi-carbonated and fully fermented. Now, that's nature's process. Now, that technique has already been done thanks to the geometry of coffee. And the geometry of coffee allows us to have a chemical, biochemical, that is odor-controlling, it absorbs your body odor, Fast drying saves energy drying and has UV protection, which is what you normally will have to do with zinc oxides or titanium oxides. We do it with coffee, after you had your cup of coffee. You know, isn't it amazing that we can use the waste of coffee, which is lignocellulosic, by the way, and I think you know that market very well, we use that waste of the coffee to farm mushrooms. The waste of the mushrooms given to the chickens or the dog. Then we can blend the waste of the coffee into the clothing, into the carpets. We can put it into MDI. We can turn it into foams for making polyurethane that are also absorbing odors. And now we're putting into paints. Have you ever thought of coffee like that? Now let me ask you the question, what is the world market price for coffee? It's about $500 a ton. If it's organic and fair trade, it's $800 a ton. How much do you think the farmer's getting in our case? $3,750 a ton. Are you interested to go threefold, fourfold? Or would you like to stick to your $500, $600 a ton? Absolutely not. We don't want it anymore. We want to value add it. Now, if we can do that with coffee, what more can we do? And here comes a little snag in there. I discovered it only a couple of weeks ago myself. It's a complete new program of dealing with coffee. And the coffee, we all know the coffee very well. We have roasted coffee. But originally, that was a green bean. So we have a new program with Melita. Oh, you remember Melita? We thought Melita was kind of going out of the market, right? I mean, because we now have these Nespresso machines or Senseo machines, and we don't need it anymore. But here it is, a Melita with an NFC code in it. You know what it means, concretely? That we are having a Melita filter, we're adding a little strip on the top of it, we are putting in the green coffee, we put in the chip, and now we have a disposable pouch. You know coffee, how it is transported when it has been roasted? I mean, that's laminated aluminum with uh, polyethylene, high-density polyethylene on the inside, PVC on the outside. I mean, it's a mess. But we love the coffee, so we tolerate it. But here is what the machine is doing. That's at the farm. At the farm, we're putting in, in the chip, in the NFC, we're putting the program to know exactly what's the profile of the coffee that goes in there. How should it be roasted? And now we're putting that into a machine that will roast, grind, and brew your coffee. And the trick 
of the whole management of the supply chain from the coffee harvested to the cup roasted is done with an NFC chip on a Melita filter. How many Melita filters do you think we're needing for doing this? Billions of filters. How much big data are we collecting? This machine is collecting more big data than anyone could have imagined in the paper industry before. The Melita filter, that little piece of paper that we thought was on the way out is now on the way in, but as a mobilizer of big data. It was not Melita who came up with that, but Melita is a key partner. I know that when you're ready to move out of your B2B and ready to venture in your B2C, with these kind of examples, Melita filter actually becomes the broker of the big data. They are brokering the big data because they are the carrier. And it's a carrier. You know the cost of an NFC on a Melita filter? It's less than 10 cents. The cash investment versus the big data accumulated, no one has ever had so much data. And if we know that at the same time big data is reinventing itself because the internet is reinventing itself. If you thought you had a Wi-Fi connection and if you're already signed up for your 5G, think again. 5G is all technology. The new technology is exactly this. Every light bulb can be transformed into a satellite. That's the technologies we're going to have. Now that is why the Melita filter is so important, because that machine links with the lights. Every light bulb, every single light bulb that you see, can perform everything that a satellite does today. If you think it's fantasy, it's already done. But doing it. As you can imagine, we have a bit of opposition. There are some people who don't like the idea too much. If you're Cisco and you're thinking about selling routers, you don't like the idea that the light bulb becomes a router. And that is part of the game. The new technology is called Li-Fi. Who knows Li-Fi? Who has Li-Fi at home? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the future. This is sensing the future. What is happening? You remember from school what is fastest in the world? Light or sound? I think we all agree light is the fastest. I mean, that's the whole basis of Einstein. So, why did we decide to have satellite connections over radio waves when you can have it with light connections right in your home? It's a kind of a surprise that the smart people of Google and Amazon didn't think about that. So the new technology is there, and there are 14 billion light points outside. Every single light point outside becomes a satellite connection. It means that I can do geolocalization. I can position perfectly. I can position perfectly where you are. Because you remember geometry and the error of geometry. If you have to do a GPS, that means you're going to have to go 40 kilometers up this way and another GPS 40 kilometers satellite connection up there. What's your margin of error? Well, about 10 meters, if you're connected all the time. What is your margin of error when you have a light there, a light there, and a cell phone here? Not even a centimeter. Are we ready to rethink GPS and geolocation? I mean, you're using satellites in your forest, right? Maybe it's about time you put some light bulbs up. <laughs> Maybe you start rethinking the contract with the satellite service providers because they are charging a lot of money. You can do exactly the same with a LED lamp. A little LED lamp can do that. Did I miss this one? Let's go to soccer, football. This is, you know where we are, it's Barcelona. And now Messi is going to take a penalty. And we're all ready with our cameras. And choop, we take the picture. Oh, too bad, you can't send it for another hour. Our telecommunication systems can't cope with 90,000 people wanting to send a picture at the same time. Try over Christmas to send a happy new year, a happy Christmas to anyone. It doesn't work. Our satellite system is clogged. In this, in this stadium, we can put 100,000 little LED lamps. You know the little ones? Every LED lamp has its own ISP 
and we can create a broadband internet connectivity that's 200 fa times faster than 5G, and that means Messi scores, 100,000 people, boom, send up the video. Live, broadcasted. You know what it is in advertising money? You created a complete new channel of advertising. There's nothing to see with everything else. Sky TV, goodbye. We're going to do it differently because you're going to have to take everyone's phone away. That's not going to work. So what we're seeing is complete new media. But when you're in a metro, have you ever tried to, to do a bit of uh, GPSing in the metro? I mean, I wish you good luck. Try. You're probably not going to find a way. You're going to have to get out of the metro, try it again, and go back in. Now, with the lights, we can give you one centimeter precise. La Défense in Paris is already equipped. Anne Hidalgo will inaugurate in March with blind people, with the visually impaired, walking through the metro, and the only thing they have is light and their telephone. One centimeter precise. This is the new market. Now, if you can do that with one blind person in a metro, what can you do with a tree? I can see on every treetop of all your plantations a little lead lamp. One little lamp that's a little diode with a little battery underneath will shine and will communicate for 10 years. Are we talking about transformation? Do you sense the change that is occurring, if this is ever possible? But we have the visually impaired already doing it. We're testing it. We're there. Now, if you can make a, a blind person walk through La Défense, four different levels in Paris, what else can you do? Well, you can guide just about anyone. And that's what we need. We need to see how we can transform. Our GPS system in a store is of absolute no use. But if you have a Li-Fi, I can tell you where the pasta is. I can tell you where the recycled paper is. And just like Google is making you pay to put your listing on there, it can tell you where is all the recycled paper. And you know exactly which store it is, and it guides you to go there. And then you have these self-driving cars of Google. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not impressed. We're creating self-driving cars actually that work over the LED lamps. Two cars communicating to each other. Do you sense the change? Do you get an idea what it all means in how we generate our data? And how you find your parking space, now you come into the parking, and the Li-Fi will tell you where there is the space. No need anymore to do this ridiculous driving around. What is happening is that public light becomes your backbone. That's the backbone of your information. Now, do you remember big data? Who owns big data? The one who owns the transmission lines owns the big data, and the one who owns the server. Now, if it is public light, who owns that? If it is your light who owns that, big data becomes your data. You have a complete redefinition of data, thanks to this technology that can penetrate your office. Now, and, and by the way, it has no radio waves, so it is very healthy. No insomnia, you can sleep very well. We have to think about health, environment, speed, innovation, and we can see how it actually transforms what we do. And next time you buy a computer, the computer will be bought with your lamp along with it because the lamp is your connection to the internet. Because it will have a special key for you, just for you. This is the kind of innovations that we're looking at. But some are much simpler. You know, I was president of an organization that was making detergents and surfactants. I'm talking about 1991. And I was actively producing biodegradable soaps. And we were producing special surfactants for the paper recycling, because we need to get this ink off, right? And so we were using, we were producing this. Now, what I didn't know when I developed this company and our biodegradable alternatives, that it was made from palm oil. And as you all know very well, even what the palm oil industry is trying to tell us that it is sustainable, I don't know how you can make something sustainable that is standing on a spot where the rainforests were before. I mean, I wish Mr. Paul Pullman a lot of luck with his efforts with Unilever and his roundtable for sustainable palm oil, but it's a challenge. Now again, don't be a negative, don't go against. What's the alternative? And the alternative is indeed very simple. 
There are eight factories in, Europe, in Brazil. That's the market leader because they are the biggest uh, ordinance juice producers in the world. But at the same time, anyone at home, when you press juice, you can just take one kilogram of, of peels of your citrus, one liter of water and seven spoons of sugar, and three weeks later you have your own surfactant with which you can skim off the ink from your recycled paper. That's made with orange peels. It even smells like orange peels. <laughs> have, you, have you been to one of these recycling plants lately? It doesn't smell like orange at all. I mean, it smells like something else, and you know, it's uh, whatever you want to do about it, it's not the most pleasant smell that you have ever had in the life. But this way, you can do it at home, you can test it. Again, it's one of these projects where we took reality and we translated it into fantasy, because people don't believe it's possible. Our biggest obstacle today is that many times people don't believe it can be done. Can you imagine that? We are so much boxed in with our ideas that when we hear something that is so fantastic, we translate fantastic into fantasy. Instead of saying, how can we be part of that new reality? Perhaps one of the most fantastic projects I've been able to develop over the years is this project where weeds turn into biochemicals in food. Don't think this is small. This is the first Junker project approved 2015 and that's ours 2015 we were approved for turning something quite incredible into a portfolio of chemicals le chardon thistles il cardo whatever language you want to talk about it it's a weed and you know what we normally have to do with it we have to buy glyphosate and spray it and you know what happens it doesn't work but it's mandated so for the next five years, we have to keep on spraying the same stuff, except one small change. We're harvesting cardoon or thistles on the island of Sardinia, 360,000 tons. We're transforming the cardoon, the oil, with steam into azelaic and pelargonic acid for the chemists. That means we're turning it into an acid that can either be a glyphosate substitute or it can be a raw material for bioplastics. We're making today the capsules for Lavazza solely out of coffee capsules, of course, solely out of cardoon thistles. We're producing the elastomeres, the lubricants, and here is the thistles' revenge we're making the substitutes for glyphosates. We're the only product today approved on the market that's a substitute to glyphosates. We can use it already in Belgium for potatoes. You know, for Belgians, this is very important. Uh, potatoes should be preserved and taken care of. Uh, and so Belgian potatoes now have the license and the permission to use our thistle-based product to spray as a herbicide. In France, of course, Les Vignes, we can apply it to the vineyards. Because who wants the Chateau Petrus with glyphosates in it? I mean, we just don't think that's a good idea. And uh, in Italy, we're approved already for apples and pears, fruits. But our byproduct is a bacterial enzyme that grows on the flower. And so we've become the largest supplier of yeast to the Italian goat cheese market. Now, let me be very honest with you. You start with a thistle, you're thinking going into lubricants and to bioplastics and you end up by being a yeast producer for goat cheese. Are you prepared to cluster business? Or are you going to force yourself to continue core business? I'm submitting to you that the future of generating high value added products is that you get out of a very tight straight jacket that is called core business strategy. If you are and will, you will remain commodity and tough to survive. What we do know is that by having seven products out of a thistle, which I can submit to you, the cost price of thistles is rather low. Um, actually, they pay you to harvest it. Um, have you been paid lately for harvesting trees? I mean, usually you've got to pay. So, so why don't we look together at how we're able to produce a multiple of value? 
Our multiple is around 3,800 euro per ton of thistles. 835 million invested. And what's perhaps more important, we've taken over the old ENI petrochemical facility in Porto Torres, Sardinia, and we turned it into the largest biorefinery of Europe. I know Borregard in Norway is doing biorefineries. It's a tiny one. I know that the Finns are doing some binary refineries. I applaud it. Come and have a look at ours. We'll share. We'll give you the insights. Because we believe that bioeconomy, in the end of the day, is chemistry, is fuel, is high value added products, and food. Because if you want to diversify, you're going to go for products and markets where there is a continuous demand, a stable demand. You don't want to go through these fluctuations of hula hoops. You want to go for stable markets because you come from a stable market. You want to go for market segments where you can see the long term. Because there's nothing you can do about it. The trees indeed take a little bit more than a bacterium. But if you look at the integrated cash flow analysis, and that's not what the MBEs or MBAs are taught at INSEAD in Fontainebleau, where I got my MBA. I mean, we need integrated cash flow analysis. Your look of the future is completely different. Actually, you will not be able to defend with your shareholders that you're not going for a cluster of products. And on top of that, our asset base, if you start with an asset that is considered to be a brownfield, and out of our cash flow, we can clean it up. What's the value of our corporation in 20, 25 years? And who is now your institutional investor is going to join you? Are you also discussing that in your groups? Sensing the future? That's also knowing who are the investors I want in my shareholding, not just the investors I got. Because I'm sure that sometimes you wish another investor than the one you got. And we are in that exact same game. If you are an innovator, you have to be able to align what you think is the business opportunity with your existing asset base and align with that with your financing. And that is exactly where the innovation is not just the innovation of transforming one product into a bioproduct. The innovation is not substituting something with a bio thing. The innovation is transforming the business model. We are in need of transforming business models. And the most difficult thing to do is the transformation of the business models because that means you're changing the rules of the game. And some other people will resist that change. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an incredible privilege in life that the Chinese government has decided that every fable that I write, which is this reality turned into fantasy, is made available to all children in China. I don't know why I deserve that. I'm the only foreign writer in China that is allowed to publish all his books, and I have now 144 already published in China. I'm Belgian. Of course, I'm not published in Belgium. <laughs> I'm not Hergé, I'm not Tintin. So, you know, you have to respect that Tintin is much better. But what I think is important in this game, if we want to be successful long term, sensing the future, it will not be possible unless you connect with the children, the future. 50% of my time is spent with industry and policymakers, making clear that there are obvious new ways of generating massive value with what we have, surprisingly, positively, but the other 50% of my time is spent on this, with children. If you are not able to connect with the next generation, and that is not by internet or Li-Fi, that's by telling them stories that inspire them, because the future seems so incredibly bright when they're able to get a sense of where it's all going to, then I think you will be able to transform your own business without any difficulties. Thank you.